One, two, one, two, check, check. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, U, V, W, S, Y, Z. Now I know my ABCs.
Good morning, South Sound. Let's try that again. Oh, come on. Good morning, South Sound. Good morning. Much better. All right. Feel free to stand as we begin worship this morning with my lighthouse. be seated. Hey, good morning, South Sound family. Hey, and if you guys are joining us online, good morning and welcome to you. Say hi to Pastor John for me, um, because I don't actually get to see him when he's online with you guys. Uh, He's hanging out in another room so that he can not be distracted by us in here, and he can just focus on you guys. So uh, drop a line to him, say hello, let us know where you're viewing from. Uh, Before I get into the announcements, we got some stuff going on I want to let you know about. I just want to say, if you are getting here early enough, at 9.30, we gather in the foyer for some fellowship and coffee, and this morning we were blessed with home-baked cookies, is that right, Judy baked those? So Lenny's wife, Judy, baked some homemade cookies. They were delicious. If you missed out, you got to start showing up at 930. Seriously. Get some coffee, get some cookies. Um, And then I don't know if you guys noticed this, but I got to just point this out. 
Our drum shield, if you remember, uh, we had some issues with the hinges and they broke. And uh, like at one point, one of the shield pieces fell over. And we didn't want that to happen anymore. So Andy, the young man behind the drum kit right now, he was like, hey, Pastor Rob, if you buy some hinges, I will attach them. So he, and I understand Scotty helped you too. His brother Scott helped him. So thank you, gentlemen. It looks great, doesn't it? It looks great. Well done. Well done. I won't mention the one that's a millimeter low. I won't mention that one. Okay, so <laughs> good job. Thank you guys very much. This is what's going on at South Sound. Today, we have, right after uh, the service, Exploring South Sound Church. So for those of you that are newer, if you attended uh, Pizza with the Pastor, this is kind of a follow-up to that, where we're going to be talking about ministry at South Sound Church, what we're really all about, what we believe, and how you could get p- plugged in. It's not required, but uh, definitely I do encourage it. One of the best ways for you to grow is to serve, and so we'd love to get you involved. We've got a great event coming up. Speaking of serving, this is going to be an all-hands-on-deck. On June 25th, we have a summer kickoff neighborhood barbecue. We have sent postcards out to the surrounding houses, letting them know, hey, we're here, and we'd love for you to come and enjoy a free barbecue But uh, there's going to be bouncy houses, there's going to be lawn games, there's going to be a a root beer float bar, I understand. Uh, There's going to be all kinds of great stuff. So the only thing missing is you guys. So we need you to come, and we want every ministry to be responsible for a certain area. So I'm going to be sending out an email. Actually, take that back. Debbie's going to be sending out an email on my behalf this week. Be looking for it to let you know what your areas of responsibility are. But we definitely need some help. We're going to be uh, blowing up the bouncy houses, and we have to clean them off and all of that. That's going to happen over at uh, Debbie's house. So please check in with Laura. She is our community uh, outreach coordinator, and she directs all of this stuff, um, does a great job, by the way, and connecting us to our community. So the sign is out on the lawn. My understanding is that sign is going to be able to stay out because we're, we're two weeks out. So that sign will be out there. Everybody who drives down this busy road will know. You can also check online on our website at the calendar, and it'll tell you a little bit about it. If you have any more questions, please feel free to check in with Laura, or if you'd like to volunteer, check in with Laura. Uh, Next up, we've got summer camps coming up. School is over, and well, for most, and um, summer's here. So you wouldn't know it by the weather. It was raining all day yesterday, but in Washington, that's still summer. And so we got summer camps coming up, and we got camp for, for almost all ages. Unfortunately, if you are up to second grade, we don't have kids camp from you. But if you are in third grade right now, and you're finishing third grade on up, there is summer camp for you. So we got kids camp, we've got middle school camp, we got high school camp. It happens at Miracle Ranch, which is a Krista camp, and it is a lot of fun. We have been partnering with them for years, and they have, they're on a beautiful lake. They've got canoes and uh, things like that, swimming to do on the lake. They've got a ropes course. They've, the food is amazing. And so uh, definitely, if you have any questions, check in with either Pastor Josh for kids camp, check in with Chris for for junior high or high school camp, and we want to see every kid go. So here's the deal. There is a cost for camp, but if you cannot afford it, don't let money be the only thing that keeps you from going to camp. We have done fundraisers, and we have people that are willing to scholarship individual kids to camp. So let's get every single kid to camp, okay? All right. Um, And speaking of camp... I want you to put this on your calendar. Save the date. Family camp. South Sound Family Camp is going to be August 18th through 20th. That's going to be at Long Beach. And uh, Becky has offered up her house. We held it there last year. And it was a lot of fun. We sat around the fire pit. Uh, we, we sang worship songs. We uh, wrote to s'mores. Josh brought his uh, portable smoker, and we had a brisket, and we're going to do that again. So it's a great time. You don't want to miss it. Uh, we even went out and spent some time on the beach. And trust me, when you think of Long Beach, you think of like a cold, windy beach where you can't go swimming in the ocean. Well, Becky, being a local... She knew the right beach to take us to, and there's this little cove beach. It's a sandy beach. I felt like we went from Long Beach, Washington to, like, Hawaii. It was crazy. You could go swimming in the water, and, and, and people did, and uh, it was a blast. It was ridiculous. I was like, how are we still in Washington? It was beautiful. So the locals know about this beach. The, the outsiders don't, so luckily we're in with the locals. So please visit the Connection Center to go ahead and sign up. 
And uh, last but not least, a little bit later in our service, we're going to be giving back to the Lord in our tithes and offerings. If you are our guest, I just want to welcome you here today and let you know that, hey, we don't expect you to give. If you'd like to, that's great. Uh, but if, if you're our guest, you can feel free to be our guest and let that basket pass by. The regular tenders know what to do. And you can always give online safely and securely. Uh, just go to our website and click on the giving tab. So that's all I've got. What do you say we stand up again? Now let's continue worshiping the Lord together.
this time I'd like to invite the ushers forward and pray with me as we pray over this offering. God, I just pray a special prayer, special blessing over this offering, God. Uh, get our hearts in the right place, moving forward, that this isn't just tossing money in a basket, this is giving back to you, God. Thank you for all that you do. We pray. spoke a word, you're singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so
Father God, we give you praise this morning. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you sent your son because you loved us and you wanted to regain that commitment that was lost at the fall. God, we give you praise. I think about our circle up this morning and we're talking about how, you know, sometimes we go through hard times in our lives. Not sometimes, we do go through hard times. But yet you see us through those hard times. You hold us. You lift us. You carry us when we can't walk on our own. All because you love us. God, we give you praise for who you are and what you're doing in our lives, God. Be with Pastor Rob today, God. Speak through him. Speak to our hearts exactly what we need to hear this morning. God, we praise you for your servant, Rob. Pastor Rob, and I just thank you for just his vision and his heart for our church, God. And we just praise you for our lead pastor, God. And I just thank you and just be with us this morning. In your son's amazing name, you may be seated. Kids, let's go to Kids Church. For those of you who are here in the sanctuary, you know, we got, we got a 30-second video bumper. And during that time, the worship team has to move all of their instrumentation back. In case I want to walk around, even though we have no one on the camera right now, I thought we were going to have somebody, so I could go this far. So in case I want to walk around or anything, I don't want to trip over anything, because that would be bad. But uh, every once in a while, 30 seconds proves to be almost not enough time. And so those of you that were here... You got to see Taylor sprint off stage. I didn't know he could move that fast. Good job, buddy. Good job. All right. Good morning, everyone. We have been spending this past month in a series titled, To My Friend Who Left the Faith, a letter to a prodigal from a prodigal. This is the book that the series is based on, and it's a book written by a gentleman, a pastor named Wade Bearden. And if you've missed the last few or uh, just one of them, go back online and uh, you can catch up. But uh, I shared with people this morning, as I've been reading this book, it's been giving me the opportunity to think about my friends who either have left the faith or who have never been a part of the faith. And um, it's given me good stuff to think about. They say that uh, sometimes we're the only Jesus that somebody's ever going to meet in their lifetime. And so the question that I'm wrestling with is, if somebody, after encountering me, being the only Jesus they've encountered, were to write a a story about who Jesus is, would the Jesus in that story be an accurate depiction, or would it be terribly inaccurate? And so church, we got to ask ourselves that question. As the church, is the picture that we are painting of Jesus accurate, and would it cause somebody to want to be a part of the faith what it caused them to run away. So let's, let's dive in. We're in week four. I'm going to give you a quick recap. Um, in week one, we looked at the parable of the prodigal son and how we need to strive to be more like the father in the parable instead of the elder brother, who in spite of the fact that he wasn't the one harmed or wronged by his younger brother's decision, he still remained indignant that the father welcomed him back with open arms. And uh, Wade stated to his friend in this letter that he's writing uh, that you can still be a prodigal without ever leaving the church. And some of us can identify with that. In week two, we looked at Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, and he wasn't writing to convince them of Christ's resurrection, but to remind them that this is what we're doing this for. And we talked about how uh, the evidence of Christ's resurrection is so overwhelming, and we have more documentation from that first century First-hand testimonies that were written uh, while 
people were still remembering this fresh in their minds within the, the first decade. Um, and Paul's words are still true today. And what he wants us to know is that we can ask questions about our faith. Christianity doesn't have anything to hide. We can go to the Bible. We can, we can go to the church and to God with our questions and our doubts. It's okay. And God expects us not to just sheepishly follow him, but to, to wrestle with our faith. And last week, uh, Chris spoke, and he talked about forgiveness. And he went into Matthew 18, and he, and he, and he talked about the, the parable of the, of the wicked and lazy servant who was forgiven much, but then after he had been forgiven, he went to his fellow servant who owned him, owed him just very little, and he started throttling him, saying, oh, you owe me. And uh, the best way to combat hypocrisy in our lives, Chris was sharing with us, is by continually reminding ourselves of God's grace. A heart that has received God's grace will naturally want to give that grace to others. So how are we doing on that? And, you know, we just sang this song, Good, Good Father. And in case you miss it, the lyrics say, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like. So, so that tells us two things. Not only, not only are there many views on what people think God is like, but the author clearly says of what they think you're like. So it tells us that he has a differing opinion than what the world thinks God is like. He's got a different story. But I wanted to touch a little bit on what are some of the different views that people have of God. And you know, here's the crazy thing. This is people that are in the faith, people who would call themselves Christ followers, as well as people who are not. Obviously, there are some that say, you know, I don't believe there's God at all. There is no such thing as God. That's one view. But for those that do believe that there is a God, there are a thousand stories, apparently. Some think of God as a cosmic vending machine. If I put my prayer token in, God's obligated to give me my desire. And you know how we are with vending machines? We put in the requisite amount. I would say 50 cents, but those days are long gone. Have you been to a vending machine lately? The prices have gone up so much that they take credit cards now, people. You, can, you don't even have to swipe it anymore. You can just hold your credit card against it, and it's beep. You're authorized for five bucks, which is one purchase, by the way. One purchase for five bucks. You think I'm lying? Go, go to the hospital ER waiting room. Try the vending machine there. Okay, so we think of God sometimes as a cosmic vending machine, and what happens when we put our money in the vending machine and we push our selection, A, 7, and uh, it comes out and it falls against the glass, or nothing happens. We get upset. We start shaking the vending machine. Give me what I'm owed. And sadly, we treat God that way sometimes with our prayers. Lord, I really want this awesome thing in my life to happen, so Lord, make it happen. And we walk away going, hey, neighbor didn't claim it. I prayed for it, therefore it's going to happen. I'm going to have this great thing happen in my life. And then when it doesn't happen, we, God, why didn't you give me my thing? I put in my prayers. I spent my time on my knees. Don't be elbowing your spouse, by the way, as I, as I mentioned these different things. Don't, that's, not a, that's not a good thing. Um, I mean, you can think it silently. Yeah, that's, that's him. But don't be like, okay. I can see it from up here. They can't see it from back there, but I can see it from up here. I'm like, yee. Um, some people think of God as, as the judge, the judge who just sits in judgment, the, the judgmental judge. I can't think of another word, but judge is judge. That's what they do. But they think that they're there, and I don't know if you've ever gone to traffic court. Most of you probably don't speed or break any traffic laws, but for those of us who have at some point in our lives broken a traffic law, you go and you sit in court, and you sit in a seat much like what you're sitting in now, only it's not padded. I've never been in a padded one. And you, and you just sit there and you wait and you kind of sweat it out. And you wait for the judge to call your case up. And then you got to go up and you got to plead your case. And you got to go, oh, well, your honor, you see, um, I just, I was distracted by my crying baby in the back and I was trying to get him to the hospital appointment on time. And uh, you see, he's got the surgery coming up and uh, I just, I didn't see the speed limit sign and I, I was going, I'm so sorry. Please, please be lenient. And we're fearful that the judge is going to say, you know what, I have heard your case, but no, into the slammer with you. And we hold that kind of view of, of God, like God just sitting there waiting, and that every time we mess up, he's just adding it to our docket. Mm, okay. Ooh, thinking that, are you? Oh, you said that? Ooh. Disrespected your mom? Mm -mm -mm. 
And then when we stand before God and plead our case, you see, Lord, I, I, was, I was born into a sinful family, and, and I didn't know any better. And, and yes, I sinned, and I'm so sorry. And he's going to look at all of that and go, yeah, well, into the slammer with you. And he's going to push a button, the doors open up, <whistles> we fall all the way down into the fiery pit. I don't think that's how it works. Some of us think of God as a benevolent dictator, that he makes all the rules, he enforces all the rules, and if we break the rules, his people are going to come after us. But as long as we stay on his good side, he'll be good to us. So we brown nose. We start off our prayer, oh, heavenly Father on high, most gracious, benevolent Lord of all, creator of the universe, Daddy God, Abba Father. Uh, Please, if you don't mind, if it's not too much to ask, just grant me this one little request for your humble servant. It might work, but I don't think we can manipulate God. God already knows what's on our heart, so so there's no sweet talking God. If we say those things from the heart and we we call him, oh, gracious father, because we really believe it, that's one thing, but come on. I can tell you right now, as a parent, when my kid comes up to me and they're like, they use anything but one type, If if they say more than just daddy or dad, and when they're asking for something, I know something's up. Daddy? My favorite parent. Uh Uh-oh, here it comes. Best dad in the world. He's always so good to us, always so kind and so gracious. What do you want? (laughs) Well, uh, I want that new OLED switch, daddy, sweet father of mine. Daddy dearest, can I rub your back? A little sore right there, dad? Have you been working out, dad? Okay. Um, If you come over to our house, Megan does have a new OLED switch, so maybe it works. Okay, but we can't do that to God. He knows what's on our heart even before we open our mouths, so just be honest. Some, some of us have this Old Testament view of God. He's a vengeful warlord that uh, for, those who, for those who uphold his commandments, he will, he will let us slide, but those of us who break his commandments, he's going to rain fire and sulfur down on us and turn us into pillars of salt and destroy us and Seven generations to come. I don't know the last time you saw fire raining down from heaven. I, I mean, it's been a while. Hasn't happened during my lifetime. I don't know of anybody personally that's been turned into a pillar of salt or anything. And so some of us go, oh, well, that's the Old Testament God. The New Testament God is completely different because the New Testament God is love. And so, so we've got this Old Testament, New Testament view. You know, Old Testament God was vengeful. New Testament God is loving and forgiving. And, but you know, the Bible tells us several things about God that are black and white. First of all, God is unchanging. So the same God of the Old Testament that destroyed entire cities and peoples is the same God that sent his son to die for us. How do you reconcile that? God didn't change. He didn't one day go, oh, you terrible, horrible people, I'm killing you. Oh, you know what? I'm tired of killing you guys. Here, have my son. No, it's not how it works. So how do we see God? How do we see God? I think that every single one of us at times have a distorted and unbiblical view of who God is. It may not be a persistent view. It may only be momentary. Like as we're getting ready to to pray for something because we're going through a hard time, maybe the thought crosses our mind. Is God going to hear this prayer? Lord, would you, would you even answer this prayer? Do I even deserve to have my prayer answered by you, God? I don't know. And I'm here to tell you, church, it's okay to wrestle with these thoughts. But let us, let us have a, a clear view of who, who God is. In the book, uh, Wade talks about uh, Olaf Stapleton's 1937 science fiction odyssey, Star Maker. Okay. Has anybody ever seen the 1937 classic Star Maker? Nobody here. Okay. All right. I was sure there'd be somebody in our congregation. Okay. So apparently it's a cosmic quest that ends with the main character realizing that the deity he searched for isn't anything like he imagined. It's not that the God is evil. He's just disinterested in humanity. He has completed his grand project and observes his creation like an artist looking at one of his own paintings. I wonder, have we ever been tempted to view God that way? During periods of intense suffering, have we ever wondered if God actually sees us? 
as we were going through all of this COVID garbage with the shutdowns and lockdowns and all of this stuff, were we wondering at any point, God, are you, are you even there? Is this COVID disease, is this what you're going to choose to end the world with? Is Jesus coming back? And during part of that, some of us were like, I hope so. Come back quickly, Lord. Come quickly. But I think if we're going to talk about God and we are going to represent God to a world that doesn't know him, church, I think we need to have a biblical understanding of who God is. So let's go ahead and turn to the scriptures and we're going to turn to a pretty familiar passage in John chapter 1. We're going to just look at a few verses here, 14 through 18, but if you've got your Bibles or your digital Bibles, let's turn to John chapter 1 verse 14. And these are words that you guys have probably read a thousand times. It says here, the word became flesh, and you'll notice word is capitalized there, the logos, the word. Speaking of Jesus, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Parenthetically, he says, John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Which John are we referring to here? John the Baptist. Okay, just want to make sure, you know, if we're in the book of John, we want to make sure that we're talking about the right John. Okay. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. Amen? So this week, we're going to talk a little bit about pain and suffering. A lot of people have trouble accepting Christianity because they say that it's difficult to reconcile the fact that there is a loving God and at the same time, such a bad, bad world. And we see it in this right here. It can be tempting to think of God as an aloof and distant God. But that's what makes this passage in John, and for the matter, the entirety of of Jesus' ministry, such a powerful response to all the evil in the world. John 1, go back and I encourage you to read the whole thing, describes what theologians call the incarnation. The incarnation literally means what these verses explicitly spell out. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, became flesh and dwelt among us. So when we speak of the incarnation of Christ, that's what we're talking about. And it can be easy to view the incarnation in an academic way, very scholarly minded. But the reality of Jesus' fleshly existence, if we really stop and think about it, it kind of stops us dead in our tracks, doesn't it? Think about it. Jesus existed, pre-existed even, before time began, as part of the Holy Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The three in one. Perfect unity. Perfect love. Never a quarrel betwixt them. Let it be known that I used the word betwixt. Thank you. (laughs) Wade writes in his book about the incarnation. He says this. Jesus left all the luxuries of heaven, whatever those must feel like. While he never ceased to be part of the Trinity, Jesus nevertheless took on the pain and toil of a mortal. Like I've said a bunch of times before, I don't understand how it works, but Jesus was fully man and fully God at the same time. So, While he says he never gave up being part of the Trinity, he took on all the pain and toil of a mortal. He experienced all the lows of adolescence. He experienced disease, sickness, and even the stomach flu. He experienced first century dentistry, whatever that was like. He knows what it feels like to be alone, to be rejected, and to lose loved ones. I apologize, but Wade wrote this in the book. He even defecated. That means he went boom, boom in the toilet. Yes, Jesus became flesh. He became vulnerable. 
when he knew all authority. He was born naked and placed in a feeding trough, then later died naked after being nailed on a cross. He died exposed to the possibility of loss, not just of human life, but of his very identity as a divine son with whom the Father was well pleased. It doesn't get any fleshlier than that. Jesus was one of us. Jesus experienced all the hardships. I think about the struggles that I've been through in my life, and I think Jesus has gone through similar struggles. I don't think Jesus was a rambunctious, like, rebellious teen. Joseph would come in, Jesus, I told you to clean your room. You're not my dad! No, I don't think that was Jesus. It's kind of funny to picture, but I don't think that was him. But he experienced issues. I'm sure that all of the siblings weren't always treated fairly. I'm sure the the brothers got sick and tired of hearing, can't you be more like your brother Jesus? I'm sure he played pranks on his brothers. Hey, let's go walk out on this water. There's this, we can can walk right out on it. Let's go. And he walks out and his brother follows, sploosh. Oh, well, you can't walk on water? My bad. Can you imagine little baby Jesus hanging out with the family at the beach? They're, they're vacationing. He goes boom, boom in his little nappy, so they have to change him. And little, little taller Jesus starts running away from dad. He's like, Jesus, come back here, come back here. And he runs out on the water. No! They're pretty hilarious. <laughs> Taylor, Amber, you guys think you have trouble running after Theo? Just be glad he can't run out on the water. <laughs> when that kid gets going, man, he's got a motor. Hey, he's fast. Keeps them on their toes. That's why Taylor can run so fast. (laughs) So in light of all this fact that that Jesus is fully human and yet fully God, what does Christianity say about suffering? There are many theological defenses to the problem of evil. The greatest defense of all, however, is that God chose. He didn't have to. He chose to suffer with us. He sees our pain And he provides us with hope now and the hope of resurrection later. He continues to write this. Some Christians have sought to defend Christianity from the problem of suffering by teaching that suffering does not exist for the faithful. And I got to tell you something. If you're going through a tough time, if you're asking for prayer from your church family because you're prayed out, you've prayed all you can, and you're struggling, you're wrestling, is God even hearing my prayer? Is God going to answer me? And somebody comes to you and they even hint, they even suggest, well, maybe you're not praying hard enough. I don't know about you, but murder might get added to my list of sins. Because that's not the right time to be telling people, oh, yeah, you just got to pray harder. Maybe you're not giving enough to the church. As though somehow increasing your tithe is going to make your prayer come true. I don't believe that. Don't believe any pastor that tells you that. It's not in the Bible. Wade writes, I'm here to defend Christianity by teaching that suffering existed for the most faithful of them all. I don't know why my dad died so young or why brokenness cuts through the lives of so many or why Priscilla recently had a miscarriage, but the God of the universe doesn't ask me to just suck it up. He came down to earth to suck it up with me. We don't always get a straight answer regarding suffering, but we do know one thing for certain. If God is willing to dwell in our pain with us, then he must have a good reason for allowing us to experience the pain in the first place. You know, as I read through this stuff, there's this profound thought that kind of jumped into my head, and I've been wrestling with it back and forth for a couple weeks now. I've heard it said before that perhaps God sent Jesus down and allowed him to suffer so that he could identify more closely with us. And I believe that's true. But have you ever thought about it this way? Perhaps God allows us to suffer so that we can more closely identify with Jesus Christ. Think about that for a second. Jesus was without sin. He was experiencing all the luxuries of what it was like to be a part of the Trinity before time began. It was perfect. And then he came down to earth. 
He dwelt amongst us. He experienced people lying to him, lying about him, mistreating him, people harming one another, war and famine. He experienced torture and ridicule and mockery and finally death, excruciating death on a cross. Why? So that we could be reconciled to God. He knew that this wasn't something that we could accomplish on our own. And it's not like he was saying, yeah, Dad, sign me up. Let's do this. I can't wait. I've shared this with you a lot. The scriptures tell us that that he went to the garden of Gethsemane with his disciples and he told them, first of all, he's like, pray for me. Pray for me. My soul's willing, but my body's weak. He was so anxious and said that he was sweating drops of blood. I've been pretty anxious. I've been pretty torn up inside. I felt physically like I couldn't take another step, but I've never in my life been so stressed out that I've started sweating drops of blood. He was in anguish over this idea. So he prayed to God, not once, not twice, but on three separate occasions in that garden. He said, Father, if there is any way to pass this cup from my hand, if there's any way, Dad, that we can reconcile these people to you, because they need reconciliation, but if there's any way to avoid the torture and the mockery and the pain, let's do it that way. Dad, you spoke everything into existence. I was there. Can't we just speak sin out of the world? But no. He said, not my will be done. Dad, don't worry about the things that I want. I'm going to submit my will to yours, Father, and we're going to do it your way because your way is perfect. So he humbly submitted himself to death, even death on a cross, so that we wouldn't have to experience that. So why then, church, why do we allow ourselves to get caught in the mire and the muck of everyday life? Why is it that when tough things happen to us who are Christ followers, sometimes we don't treat it any differently than someone who doesn't believe there's a God at all? We go into, woe is me. I'm such a victim. How will I ever find my way out of this? And you know what? I'm not pointing the finger. I've been there myself. I've asked God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me? Why aren't you handling this problem for me, God? I can't do it. And there's this thing that, that people teach, but it's not from the Bible. And I don't want to put down anybody who's taught this, but I'm hoping that maybe I can shed some light. But if you've ever said, God will never give us more than we can handle, you're absolutely incorrect. Go back and read the Bible. Read all the, the, the quests, I'll say, the, the quests that God has sent people on. They were almost always more than that person could handle. But let's rewrite that a little bit. Let's reword it. God will never give us more than he and us can handle together. God's in it with us. And if we lean on God, who's there with us, if we remember that he's never left our side, he's never forsaken us, and he never will, then we can get through anything. The question is, when you're in it, which direction are you going to lean? Are you going to lean on God and let him be your support? Let him hold you up when you can't hold yourself up? Or are you going to lean away from him? Because then there's nothing there to catch you. The choice is clear. We know what we need to do, but the question is, why do we keep not doing it? Why is it that even though those of us who have faith in God sometimes allow ourselves to get sucked into a worldly way of thinking? Well, I think there's a practical answer. For those who have ever lifted weights or participated in sports, Anybody who at one point in their life was considered a great athlete, you know that exercise and bodybuilding, and all, it's, it's a use it or lose it kind of thing. 
I'm going to pick on my buddy Rick over here because Rick is a good guy and he won't mind. Rick, you were an athlete and you played water polo at a very high level, correct? Uh, great swimmer, etc. Would you say that you're in the same shape now that you were in your 20s? <laughs> His dad is over here bust out laughing before Rick could even answer. <laughs> okay, but let me ask you this, Rick. So you said no doubt your answer is no. You're not in the same shape that you were in your 20s, but are you working out the same way that you did when you were in your 20s? No. Neither am I. I know most of you couldn't tell, but let myself go a little bit since my 20s. I used to be in the gym five days a week sometimes. Now I'm in the, j the gym five days every five years approximately. I mean, you know, I, uh, I think about working out. I sometimes even think about, okay, if I went to the gym, what would I do? Well, first I'd hit the sauna, loosen up in the sauna a little bit. And then, uh, man, would I get on the treadmill? No, that's a lot of work. The elliptical? Ah, Okay, maybe I'll just sit in the sauna and then come home. I don't know. But the heat burns off fat, so even that's beneficial. But then it costs gas money to drive out to the gym, and then I just kind of talk myself out of it. I think we do this, our faith is the same way. Faith is like a muscle. You have to exercise it. And the more you exercise it, the stronger it gets. If I go back to the gym right now, there's no way I'm lifting what I used to lift in my peak. If I do, I'm going to tear a bicep. I'm going to rupture a pectoral or worse, just die of a heart attack. I don't know. If you haven't worked out for a while, you've got to ease yourself back into it. So let me tell you, when it comes to faith, it's the same way. If you're not used to trusting God with these big, heavy things, let me tell you something. Try trusting him with little things. Don't, don't only turn to God when your life is falling apart, but turn to him and trust him to provide every single day. Start your day off by recognizing what he's already done for you. If you've opened your eyes and you've taken a breath, that's two things that you can thank God for. And since he's gotten you that far, first thing in the morning, maybe you can trust him that uh, gravity's not going to give out and you're going to just go flying off into space, that he's going to get you through the rest of the day, whatever may come. And then when you get through the end of that one day, maybe we thank God. Hey, thank you, Lord, I made it. Okay, work day was a little rough. I had that little thing with my boss, but you got me through it. So thank you. Now I'm going to trust you, Lord, that when I lay my head on the pillow, tomorrow I'll open my eyes and take another breath, and we'll do it all over again. You guys remember David and Goliath? David... David didn't train fighting giants for years and years going, okay, one day there might be this giant uncircumcised Philistine that I'll have to take out with my sling. Let me start practicing. Uh, no. He had a job to do, so he trusted God in doing his job. Lord, let me watch over my sheep and just protect my sheep. Oh, there's a lion? Well, Lord, I'm trusting you. <laughs> let me take on this lion. I'm scared, but I'm going to do it. I don't want to do it, but your will be done, not mine. So he takes on the lion, and he's successful. I have defended my sheep against the lion. And then comes a bear. I don't know if lions and bears are actually in that part of the world, I don't, but I'm assuming because it's in the Bible. So he takes on a bear. He defeats a bear. He trusts God to defeat the bear. Now the rest of these soldiers have been fighting or training for a theoretical fight against enemy. They've been practicing their swords their shields, marching forward, hoo, hoo. You, know, you guys see 300, kicking people in the pits. They've been practicing all of that. But what they didn't practice was facing a giant. So when this giant stands across the river and says, hey, come at me, bro, they're like, uh, you go first. No, you go first. And David shows up and he's like, what's going on? Oh, this giant over there is mocking God. Well, who's going to do something about it? You guys do something. You're soldiers. So they're like, yeah, you don't understand. You're just a kid. He goes, well, I understand this. God protected me against the lion. God protected me against the bear. God will surely protect me against this jerk. So he steps up. Was David afraid? Probably. He wasn't inhuman. But he knew that 
God had protected him, and God wasn't going to keep him safe against the bear and the lion just to have him slaughtered by a Philistine. So he trusted God. I say the same prayer every time before I speak, whether it's here uh, at church or whether I'm at Northwest Christian High School or any other place when I'm about to preach. I say, Lord, I'm about to go up there and open my mouth. Please don't let me make a fool of myself or of you. And God's been faithful. It's not because of me and who I am or my ability. It's because of him. So when we consider all of the things that, that God has done, why would we ever believe that he would allow us to go all through all of this stuff needlessly? I don't know the purpose for suffering in the world, but I do know that in my suffering, I can understand Jesus a little bit more. In my suffering, if I'm going through something that you're going through, I know that we understand each other a little bit more. You know, in the past month and a half, I've had people come up to me who have lost a father or who have a loved one in the hospital. And they've offered me prayers, say, hey, Pastor Rob, praying for you, I'm going through the same thing. And it makes me feel like we've got a little bit of a bond. Man, I am so sorry you're going through that. We say those words sometimes when we've never been through it and we don't really know how difficult it is. But when we've gone through it, and we look somebody in the eye and we go, I am so sorry you're suffering through that. We know what it's like. So when Jesus looks out at the masses and he has pity on them, when Jesus looks down on us from heaven and he sees what we're going through and he takes pity on us, it's not because he's one of these distorted views that we have of God. It's because in his humanity, he's been there. He's done that. He too has suffered at the hand of man. And he's telling us, you know what? It's going to be okay. You're going to get through this. And remember the words that he left with his disciples at the end. I mean, he gave them the, the, the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations and teaching them to obey all the things that he's commanded. But then he says, and surely I will be with you even to the end of the age. We're not alone. And we never will be. And we never have been. So church, as we go out from these walls and we go out into the world, there's going to be suffering. But the question is, how are we going to respond? Because how we respond to evil and suffering in the world will often determine how the world views God in light of evil and suffering. And imagine if somebody out there who doesn't know God is going through something difficult and they see us, the church, suffering through the same kind of stuff, but we have a different outlook. How can they have such peace in the, even in the midst of hardship? How can they not completely lose it when they're dealing with this difficult thing? How can they find strength in one another despite what they're going through? That might be exactly what they need to fall to their knees and say, you know what? I don't know what's going on with this crazy group of people. They call themselves Christians, but God, if you're out there, I'm willing to give it a try. So church, let's be ready. Let's be ready to, to give an account of why we do what we do in good times and in bad times. And let's go out there and let's be Jesus, even if we're the only Jesus that somebody else is ever going to see. You pray with me. Father God, I thank you so much. I thank you for this church family. I thank you for the fact that I opened my eyes and took a breath today. That's a gift from you. God, even the people that you, you bring across my path, the people that, that question me and, 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 and don't believe in me, people that, that put me down, God, I thank you for the opportunity to be Christ to them. God, I pray that you would strengthen me, strengthen all of us, so that when we do encounter tough times, we can have a Christ-like response. Help us to remember that you are always there with us, and you understand our suffering. Because you're not a distant God who's just sitting back, letting things happen to us. You have 
a purpose for each and every one of us. Let us find our purpose in you through Christ Jesus so that we can go out there and we can share that love of Christ with our community and beyond who so desperately needs him. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, God bless you guys. I love you. You are dismissed. Those of you coming to uh, Exploring South Sound, I will see you in the fellowship hall.